Welcome to the Radiant Visalia podcast. Join us at one of our two services, 9 a.m. and 1045 a.m. Download the Church Center app or visit our website, radiantvisalia.com, to stay connected with us. All right, enjoy. Well, good morning. Hey, uh, Club 456, we've actually, uh, we have something for you. Um, Lori is passing it out. And during the sermon today, there's some things that you're going to be working on. And once you finish that, you can take it back to the connect table and they have something for you. So I'm not going to tell you what that is. I'm going to leave it up to suspense. But you got to finish it. And it is a really difficult word search. So I'm just saying but I think you can handle it. I'm confident that you can do it. So here's the one rule though, as you're working on it, you can't share answers, okay? So I'm watching you and I've got a really high view of what you're doing. So I, uh, I wanna take a few minutes this morning and I wanna teach the next uh, statement of the Apostles' Creed. And, and I just want to say that I feel like I maybe um, drew the short straw um, because I've got this statement and uh, we're going to put it up here and, and let you know where we're at in the Creed. And uh, the statement we're going to look at today is the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints. So my, uh, my desire today is to disarm the word Catholic so that we don't miss the beauty of what's around it, and that is that the church is holy, that the church is made up of a community, community of saints, um, and, and we don't want that word to, uh, to shadow our understanding of that. So we're going to look at this statement today, and um, I just want to say that as we march through the creed, um, this part of the creed creates a pivot point, and um, it actually pivots from affirming our understanding of who God is to actually addressing our identity in the church. So up until this point, we've looked at attributes of God and and who he is. And we have this, I think, a healthy and a high view of God outside of us. And today we're going to zoom in on what it has to say about the character of God's people and the community of the people of God. So the design of the uh, Apostles' Creed, first of all, is I just want to mention that it's actually amazing how it's designed because it keeps in mind this idea that before we actually get to our identity, we have to have a right understanding of who God is. And uh, I want to just say it a different way. Our identity, who we are and who we're becoming is rooted in our idea about God. We must first establish a clear confession of who God is apart from us before we deal on the idea of who we are and who is in us. And I want to push on some things this morning because I think that this is a really healthy thing to do. Um, I often find uh, a lot of time being preoccupied thinking about myself, but in reality, there's a God that has some ideas about myself. And it's time that we shift our perspective and look at him. We see this same pattern of God before us in a formal discussion that Jesus had with his disciples. And many scholars and theologians believe that Matthew 16 was the first moment in scripture where Jesus had a conversation with his disciples about who God is. And I want to just invite you to go to Matthew 16 with me. We're going to pick up on uh, verse 13 and take it from there. It says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the son of man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. But you, he said to them, who do you say that I am? 
Jesus responded, blessed, oh, excuse me. Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus responded, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosened in heaven. And then he gave the disciples orders to tell no one that he was the Messiah. I start here this morning because I believe that um, this is a pivotal moment in the church, the life of the New Testament church. Jesus asked his, his disciples, what are your ideas about who I am? And in verse 16, Peter says that his confession that he is the Messiah, the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus responded to Peter's revelation that on that revelation that he was going to build his church. In other words, Jesus revealed to the New Testament church, the people of God, that they were going to build on his person, that we we're going to build a church on Jesus. Again, we see this same revelation of, of Jesus saying, build my church on who I am in the apostles and how the apostles communicated to uh, new church leaders and, and churches that were being established throughout the Gentile world. Much of the letters in the New Testament had the same language of getting this right. And I just want to go through a few of them just to kind of remind us about this pattern of building on who Jesus is. Peter actually spoke in Acts, and he wrote this, that this Jesus is the corner stone rejected by builders, and he has become the cornerstone. This is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to man by which we must be saved. 1 Corinthians 3.11 says, For no one can lay any foundation other than that that has been laid. The foundation is Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2.20, again, this language shows up, built, referring to the church on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets and Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. And then finally, in 1 Peter 2, 4 through 6, Peter writes, as you have come to him, a living stone rejected by people, but chosen and honored by God, you himself as living stones, a spiritual house, are being built to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable through God, to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in scripture, see, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and honored cornerstone, and the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. So we see this foundation of Jesus is incredibly important to establishing the church. And I bring this up initially because I think that um, it's easy because we're often deceived about what to build our life on. And it's easy to go astray and begin to look for a variety of things around us that actually is a substitution of Jesus. And I know that if we, take a, if we took a, a survey or a poll today, that there would be all kinds of ideas or struggles that we would identify in our life that are that competing foundation that sometimes we put our hope in. Like relationships or vocation in our, in our job. If you're a parent, sometimes we can put a, a false foundation of, of parenthood in the place of Jesus and put our hope there. And when it starts shaking, things go incredibly wrong. Or maybe we can put financial security <clears throat> in the place of Jesus. So there's all these things that we find that we often, our heart often goes to. And we're reminded today that what we build our life on is a revelation of Jesus Christ. And before I move on from this, I just want to bring context as well to Matthew 16, because it's super interesting that it wasn't just a dialogue and a conversation uh, Jesus had with his disciples. It was actually embedded in some text that creates some context for it. And one of those contexts early, earlier on in, in um, 
Matthew 16 was this idea that the religious leaders of the time came to Jesus and it literally says that they wanted to test him. And they asked him to show them a sign. And Jesus responded by saying this, an evil adulterous generation demands a sign, but no sign will be given to you except the sign of Jonah. And then he left them and went away. And this is fascinating because what Jesus is actually saying is don't put your hope in a sign. I'm going to reveal the true foundation that I want to lay. And it's not in a sign. It's not in a miraculous moment. It's not in any of those things. It's actually in the person of Jesus. And he goes on later to establish and lay that foundation. And uh, it's, it's also interesting just to point out that he said, the, the thing I'm going to give you is a sign of Jonah. And if you remember back into the Old Testament, the book of Jonah, Jonah was a man that, that gave self-sacrifice. He was sent to Nineveh. He was swallowed by a whale. He was sacrificed. And then that whale threw him up and he was resurrected, if you will. The sign of Jonah is a, is a foreshadowing of Jesus that would come. So what Jesus is actually saying is, don't put your hope in miracles, signs and wonders, all of these things. Put your hope in Jesus, which is going to be the resurrection life to come. And that's the truth. That's the reality that we want to build on today. The identity of God's people requires a foundation. And Jesus comes first. Before we go on, I just want to invite you to consider um, what are some foundations that you find you typically default to? What are those things that create tension in your heart and life to put Jesus first? I want to speak on just a, a few minutes this morning about the four marks of the church that have been laid historically on the foundation of Jesus. And before I do that, I just want to mention that this weekend was a, a real fun weekend for us as a family. We celebrated um, Colleen's mom and dad's 55th wedding anniversary. And there was about 170 people in Visalia from Rotary to RV clubs, all kinds of different um, you know, community groups, they came out to honor Kathy and Frank. And I actually have a picture of them up here uh, to give you a little sense of what they looked like just a few years ago. <laughs> Frank has no hair and no mustache now, and it's entirely gray around the rim. So some, some mileage has happened since this picture, but it's an awesome one. And um, my, I guess my responsibility in this whole weekend was just really simple. I was to create a story to share about their life together. Um, starting back in August 9th, 1969, uh, where, when they were married. And uh, so I was thinking, you know, of the things that I'm familiar with since I became part of their family in 94. And, um, you know, there's these family get togethers that we've had, these experiences that we had, the way I know their, their life and what I've seen and experienced. And then I kind of got down this outline and then I actually went to them and had them over for dinner one night. And I said, hey, tell me about your past. Tell me about what it was like in 69 to, to marry one another, you know? And Frank's like, she was a hot babe. I'm like, whoa, wait a second here, you know? He's like, oh yeah, yeah. And she was a very strong woman, you know? So that's like the pecking order, right? Hot babe and then strong woman. Um, but it was fun just hearing about, you know, their history together. And really quick, I, I realized that, man, the Frank and Kathy I know is like half the story. There's a greater story there. And as I peered in, I made these connections. And that's how I treat the church oftentimes. Like I base the church on my experience, my limited experience in history. I base it even on like Radiant Church and the community that we love and that, and that we're a part of. And I say that with honor because what we do, I think, is really special. And I know most of us would fight for it. 
But nonetheless, that's what I base my picture of the church on. And yet, if we peer back in history, we discover that there's this long line of men and women that went before us that laid their lives down. That built on the same foundation, Jesus, that we're building on today. It hasn't changed. Technology has changed. Amps have changed. The digital media process has changed, but the foundation of Jesus has not changed. And and I just want to say that these four marks of the church have not changed through all of history. They, They remain. And when we talk about the church, we're talking about these four marks of the church. So I want to just go through them quickly here. The first mark of the church is that the the church is one. The church represents the one people of God. And this unity must be seen in the relationship to a spiritual unity, not an institutional one. This is implied in the creed's reference to church, singular, not churches, plural. All Christian churches are based and founded on the one and only foundation of Jesus. We could say that the church is a body of people that acknowledge Jesus as the head. But I know that most of our experiences are are very different than that. And sadly, we see that the church is often not not always unified in one mind. In fact, there's a multitude of denominations that are actually a testimony of how difficult it is to bring unity to the church where they've pulled away from fellowship and they've created their own creeds, if you will. And they've marked their denomination as the truest sense of what it means to be a Christian. As much as we can like lament and uh, find really uh, sorrow in that division and disagreement, one thing that's true is that uh, division is nev- it's not something new to the church. Um, disagreement has been a part of the church, even beginning in Acts. So when I speak of the church as one, I I don't want to dismiss the idea that there's been been, um, disagreement throughout history that's actually fractured it. And I don't want to take the time, but I did make a note, if, if you are interested in this, you can jot down these scripture references. These are just a few places that we find challenge and disunity in the church. And notice um, Acts 15 was the early church, and that was the very first one. And we marched through where much much of Paul's work in ministry was dealing with churches that didn't agree. But yet, Paul held on to the idea of spiritual unity and allowing some institutional disagreement to happen. So the first mark of the church is this idea that the church is one. The second mark is the church is holy. It's a holy people, separate from the world. And holiness is not of its own nature, but from the nature of the Holy Spirit inside of us. And I I love the account of Paul's life, and I just want to go there for a moment because it's a testimony of how God pulled out and transformed his life into someone that was holy, despite much of his life doing the contrary. In Acts 16, uh, verses 16 and 18, Paul gives an account, basically his testimony to King Agrippa. And he's sharing about what Jesus said to him in his conversion moment. And uh, in verse 16, it says, For I have appeared to you. And Paul's saying that Jesus is saying this to him. For this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and a witness of what you have seen and what you have seen in me. I will rescue you from your people and from the Gentiles, and I'll send you to them to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sin and share among those who are being sanctified by faith in you. Now, what does this have to do with holiness? A principle of holiness or a church that's holy is this idea that this is not um, a physical difference from the world. It's It's a qualitative difference. We're different from the inside out, from the working of the Holy Spirit that's changing our heart. In Romans, Paul, uh, 
really warns us to, hey, don't conform to the world or the church. Don't conform, but be transformed. And the church as being holy is putting our whole lives in the hand of the Holy Spirit and saying, change me because I can't do it myself. And it becomes a a qualitative difference from the inside out. We see that holiness is not necessarily under our power, but it's under the power of the Holy Spirit. And this has marked the church early on, even going back to the uh, history in Israel where Jesus, uh, where God rather uh, marked his people as a holy people and called them to be holy. So it's not new. The third mark is the church is Catholic. Yeah, you, you heard it right. Catholic. This Greek word is katholikos, which simply means this. It's according to a whole. It's universal. It means worldwide, across the ages. It does not mean the Roman Catholic Church, and it doesn't mean that we're under the authority of the Pope. It simply means that the church is built on the foundation of Jesus that spans time, that's universal, across culture, worldwide. When the early church uh, Christians referred to Catholic, they were not referring to a particular church or a denomination or rite or even a communion practice. They were simply referring to all true believers in Jesus. We're part of a church that's one. And in fact, early on, it's interesting to know that uh, Paul often addressed letters to begin with language that uh, is, is Catholic language. And I, I want to just show you some examples here. Notice the, the universal tense that Paul uses here. That we're called as saints with all those in every place who call on the name of Jesus. Romans 1, 8, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the world. Colossians 1, 5, 5 and 6. You have already heard about this hope in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. It's bearing fruit and and growing all over the world. This Catholic language of the gospel being universal, worldwide, spanning time. A New Testament scholar, Michael Bird, kind of summed it up this way. He says this, that the church is not restricted by geography, ethnicity, gender, class, or status. It's a universal assembly that is made up of people from every tribe, language, culture, and place. There is no one church that exists in all places. There is one church that exists in all places, yet it adheres to one faith. The mark of Catholicity means recognizing that God is at work in other places, in other assemblies, drawing men and women to himself and drawing them together under the banner of Jesus. We're a part of one church that's holy, that's Catholic, that's universal. And finally, the the fourth mark is that the church is apostolic. This fourth mark is the nature of being an apostolic church built on the foundation of Jesus that proclaims the teachings of the apostles and then we entrust it to other faithful men and women that will do the same. There's this passing on of our faith, generation after generation after generation. And I put down as a subline there that it's entrusted to you, not someone else. Because this is really easy to advocate to those that are in ministry or even on staff at a church. Like it's their job to take on the apostolic work of passing on the faith. But I want to say today that it's your job. It's, it's the church as a whole's job. That, that, that is what God's entrusted us with is the truth of the gospel. To share and pass on to faithful men and women who will do the same. It sounds a lot like discipleship, doesn't it? That the great commission that Jesus left us, go and make disciples.
Alistair McGrath said that faith was not once for all entrusted to the saints, has now been entrusted to us for, all, for a time before we pass it on to those who will follow us. It, our time is finite. He's given us a time, a season for this work. We and all other Christians are stewards of the same gospel once entrusted to the apostles. We have this responsibility that we hold. So the rub is, do you see yourself playing in that role today? Do you see you, you, uh, your life uh, playing an apostolic role of passing on truth and making disciples that will make other disciples? Here at Radiant, just one, one of the ways that we do that, and discipleship looks like a many different things. In, in fact, today we're being discipled and we're being formed into Jesus, the image of Jesus. But one of the real practical um, structures that we have in place are PACs, which are small groups. And uh, this season, we just felt like this conviction, like, man, we want to use PACs for a purpose of not just spiritual maturity, but multiplication. That it's a vehicle, actually, not just to become better disciples, but to make more disciples. And we are praying and trusting that God's going to use that, just that simple structure to reproduce the gospel in in many people's lives and invite people in um, to this work. So these four marks laid on the foundation of Jesus is kind of this first part, the Holy Catholic Church. And I just want to say a couple things about the communion of saints because that's a a beautiful picture of this as well. Communion is kind of an old English word for fellowship. And in the New Testament, it's the Greek word koinonia, and it simply means to share or sharing. So at one level, it means that we're sharing the joy and sorrow of our lives with others. But at another level, it means that we're sharing all that we have for the common good of each other. Each person in the early church gave all that they had for the common good of one another. It's a reminder of the mutual commitment within Christian fellowship that we have for one another. Those that are strong are responsible to love and and lead the weak. Those who have wealth and resource are responsible towards those that are poor. Let me put this in a real practical scale. I, I remember early on, I was probably like third or fourth grade, and my, uh, my dad and my mom were, were blue-collar workers, and I remember kind of always living in this state of like, just enough, like we have just enough, and sometimes we would not have enough. And I remember one night, um, us gathering as a family, and um, my parents praying that God would provide for our family food, uh, because it was, it was used, we had no more food. And my mom was a, an amazing cook. I mean, she could cook things out of like nothing, you know? Uh, I know there's some of you like that. It's a, it's a craft, believe me. It's like, you have flour and water, mom. How did you make this pie, you know? It's like, where did the other ingredients come from, you know? It's like, it's a sign, you know? And uh, I, I just remember a simple prayer, like, as a family, God, would you provide for us? And um, that next day, our uh, doorbell rang, and there were boxes of food that were left on our front porch. We didn't know where it came from. We didn't know the person that left it. All we knew was God answered a prayer. But, but that's a beautiful picture of the communion of saints. That what I have is actually yours if there's a need to meet it. So rather than holding on to the gospel and holding on to what we have, we, we open our hands and we let it go. And we're moved by the Holy Spirit of what, um, to, to the needs that we can meet. The Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints. This rejects the notion of individualism and go it alone type of Christianity. Communion emphasizes that to believe is to belong, that that we're rooted in something that's bigger than ourselves.
When we meet together, we recognize that each other are a part of the body of Christ and a unique part. We become something together. And uh, I know many of you don't have a, the opportunity or privilege to stand here and look out, but I don't see one person that's the same this morning. We all come completely unique individuals, but yet somehow God's fitting us together to become something bigger than ourselves, to belong. When we meet together, we recognize that this is a reality and we become something together. We're not individuals. There's no church of me, only a church of we. And I, I just want to um, close this portion of our service this morning by just challenging us a little bit with our thinking. What are we building our life on? What foundation that might be a substitute for Christ? Maybe you can identify what those things are and you, you can begin to become aware of it and and begin to shift your attention and your heart to something else. Or maybe, just maybe, you're approaching church in a way that's not we, but it's me. And God wants to begin to, to shift something in your heart to see that actually you are an incredibly valuable part to this church body and you have so much to give. And uh, I, I just, I'm recognized, I recognize every week how many people that we have that live as a we. We're so blessed as a church to have so many people that contribute and, and give in so many ways. But if that's not you, we want to invite you into that this morning. And I just want to uh, pray for that, just that revelation to drop today, that God would begin to speak to us and he began to put his beautiful church on display and invite us in to participate as a we together. And if there's things that we need to lay down that we've been holding on to, that we would have the courage to open our hands and say, okay, God, I trust you. Come in and rearrange my heart, rearrange my thinking. Help me see the church as to something that I can belong to. Would you, would you join me in pray? Lord, we, we just thank you today that, um, Lord, we have a, a, just a glimpse of your beautiful church. And here we are this morning celebrating what has been taking place for thousands of years before us. Lord, that people assembled under the name of Jesus, worshiping and fellowshipping and being together on mission. Lord, we just thank you for, the, for just the privilege it is to be a part of that history. And Lord, where there's faulty foundations in our own lives, God, would you replace those with just the revelation of Jesus? Would you help us build our lives on you and expose some things that will leave us wanting? And Lord, if there's also some things that we, uh, we're holding on too tight that we need to just open our hands and release, Lord, would you, by your Holy Spirit, just highlight those things to our understanding. Would we be a people that would give away our lives to one another, to those that don't know you? Lord, because your gospel is, is just too good. Your freedom, your love is too good to hold on to. So Lord, we, uh, we just say you're worth our whole lives and that we want to continue building your kingdom together in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, as we close service, um, I, I want to make a bit of a transition here because I want to highlight that one distinct part of the body of Christ by design is leaders, that God designs the church and part of that church, one of the parts of the body of Christ is leadership. And uh, we have, um, man, we have so many leaders that are such a blessing to our church. And one of the, the things that we're going to do this morning is that we're going to pray for and install deacons, which are one of those types of leaders that 
um, God gives to the church. And I want to just briefly talk about what a deacon is and who they are, and then I'm going to invite them up so you can see them, and then we're going to participate as a, as a family to pray for them this morning. So in the Bible, what is a deacon? A deacon is one of the two leadership positions of the New Testament church. The other position is the position of elders or pastors. Deacons are model servants who excel at being attentive and responsive to the tangible needs of the church body. Each of these people that you're going to see up here this morning are incredible servants, and they continually just answer the call when they see a need or when there's something that needs to be done. They're like first responders that jump in and go for it. Who are deacons in Scripture? Well, it's really interesting that when you dig around, there's not tons of examples of who they are, but there's clear text about the type of person they are and what they do. So in 1 Timothy 3, 8 through 13, here's a a list of some of the things that define what they do and how they live. They're of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit, full of wisdom. They hold the mystery of faith with a clear conscience, tested and proven. They have a faithful family life, not hypocritical, rather controlling their tongue, not drinking a lot of wine or freedom from addiction and not greedy with money, and, but generous. Man, that's an intense list, man. And I can say that um, as leaders, that's what they're pursuing. They may not be perfect, but their heart posture is, I want to become that kind of disciple of Jesus, that kind of leader. What do they do? Deacons serve by acting on behalf of the elders to guard the ministry of the word and prayer. So one of the things that uh, scripture points out is that the role of a deacon is to help release the elders to minister the word, but also be diligent in prayer. They serve by preserving the unity within the body and to mobilize and release effective ministry. They serve and care for the body in real specific ways, and then there's some real general ways that they're going to do that as well. So here at Radiance, um, who, who's going to become those deacons? I know that we have um, a large group of 456ers right up front, but I, I would love to invite um, our deacon crew to come on up and join me up here. And as they do that, uh, worship team, would you also join me? And uh, I just want to line up, have them line up right here. And in just a moment, we're going to uh, lay hands on them and, and pray for them but I want you to get a face with the role. You guys can come on up and you can stand right up here. Yeah, it's great. Come on up. If you want to go in front of me, you can do that. That's great. Yeah. Hey, we want to, as a church, we want to say that you guys are a tremendous blessing to our church and that you're part of that infrastructure that holds up just the practical side of leading and eldering and preaching the word and prayer, making this thing happen in a healthy way. And we just want to say on behalf of our church, thank you. Thank you for living in a way that represents Jesus well and also aspiring to pursue him with your whole heart. And, uh, I just want to invite you to stand up and, um, yeah, is Eric here? Gunnar, if you want to join me. We want to just lay hands on them as elders, and if you would extend a hand of blessing. And um, as they leave, there's going to be a screen that's going to be put up that identifies the area that they're going to be serving in. So you may want to know, or you might be interested in how they're going to serve. So in this next season, there's specific lanes and areas of responsibility that we're going to call them into. And that doesn't mean that it's permanent. It, it could shift, it could change, but for now, it's going to give you kind of a, a clean picture of, of where they're headed and what they're going to be up to. 
Hey, let's, uh, if you uh, wouldn't mind, would you extend a hand? This is not just good for them. This is good for us that they're released in greater ways. It's going to build and strengthen the body. So let's just bless the work of God in their lives together. We're going to anoint them and set them apart as we pray over them. Father, today we receive these deacons in the authority of your son. We recognize that though their task is humble, this office is, is noble. And we honor them as your servants. And we, we recognize their leadership with humility. We recognize their shepherding with, with trust. And we receive their encouragement willingly. We will submit to them out of a reverence for Christ. And we will make their job a joy, which is for our good, and will glorify you, Lord. By the power of the Spirit, I want to charge you, deacons, today, stir up the gift that is within you, that you would fight the good fight the good fight, that you would guard your life and guard your conduct, that you, Holy Spirit, would empower them right now to walk in love, in faith, in the holiness that Danny described. Help them, Lord, to pace themselves so that their greatest fruit of their lives will not just be sacrifice, but they'll have righteousness and they'll have peace and they'll have joy in the Holy Spirit to give away. We ask right now, Lord, that your spirit would commission these couples together in the ministry to, to lead us diligently and to lead us with integrity so that the body of Christ would grow strong and mature, would be all that you want it to be, Jesus. That the body of Christ through them would be equipped for good work. That through them you would push back the darkness through their acts of service. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to just have you remain standing. One of the first ways that they're going to serve us today is um, at the table. And um, we're going to go back into worship and give them a, a moment to find a communion station, and um, once they, they're set, just want to invite you to come up and receive Christ's body and his blood that's been shed for you and broken for you this morning, and um, meet uh, this team. Thanks for listening. We want to be a resource for you as you walk with Jesus. So please connect with us at radiantvicelia.com. Until next time. There is a heavenly city that I'm compelled to find. Oh, I love the flowers and trees and the smell of the grinding sea and all the beautiful things here in life. I, I'm a pilgrim here on the side of the grave, divine.